Okay, so welcome. Uh, note in the back, there's someone new. Uh, it's a postdoc who's here at UT uh, named Jeremy, who will be watching me learn how not to teach. Uh, um, so someone sent anonymous feedback uh, to that anonymous feedback form, which is great, saying, please give us the PDFs. Uh, and so I put them up on the website. And so you can see all the PDFs, including this one. I'll keep updating that. Also, you can see last year's lectures and the previous year's lectures, too. And since I basically, you know, I modify each year, but you can get a sense of what's coming. Okay. <coughs> uh, any questions about any of that sort of class stuff? No? Okay. Every year. So today we're going to talk about two topics. <coughs> what to save and causes of risk. Okay, and so on the open video, opening video, I mean, conservation dollars aren't infinite. I just decide where can you best put your dollars? Or if you're trying to decide, you need to, need to buy land to make you know, nature preserves. Do I do it here? Do I do it in these two places? You know, how, do you, how do you balance that? Now here's someone here down the hall, Paul Armsworth, whose research program is based largely on figuring out how best to spend conservation money. So actually, it's in, so if you're interested in doing that, you can talk to him about doing research with him. So first of all, what to save. So I said to you, here are two areas. I have enough money to buy one of these areas to preserve, and the other one's going to be paved. Okay. Um, which one should we? Which one should we buy? Which area, A or B? We're going to put a practice field in one of them. Save the other one. Right, so, which one do we save? So the blue and red circles the same size. Yeah, each one represents a species. It's five species, four species. Uh -oh. A? Right, okay, that makes sense. Now what do you think? <laughs> but you still have more species here. Yeah. I think A. Still, because the small pieces are much more important on a large scale sense to the system. Important in what way? A sustained the system is too small. Yeah, but on the other hand, I mean, elephants I think help structure the savanna by pulling up acacia trees and help keep it grassy. Lions are the reason that I got interested in science. If there weren't lions, I wouldn't be here. Is it, but is it, is it good that you're here? Well, I'm not, now I'm doing cupcakes. It doesn't matter. What do people think? Yeah, they're, they're all frogs. Yeah. It was, it's camouflage. I think it's an African clawed frog. As you can see, it's brooding its eggs. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Okay, so something like this. Um, right, and so let's prune off the subtending edge, right? And we have sort of this much history here and this much history here. Okay. And so let's just explore this idea for a while. I'm not, saying this is, I'm not saying we should save B over A, but let's look at this as a different measure and see what comes out. Okay, so how can we sort of sum this up? Well, if you take all the branches here and stack them up, right? And that is total amount of time or tree length, okay, millions of years. And I'm not going to, I didn't make a fancy animation for the other one because it takes too long. Okay. We sort of stack them up and figure out how much evolutionary history, right? And this measure has a name. It's called phylogenetic diversity. <coughs> okay. And all it is simply is just adding up the branch lengths on a tree. Now, it becomes more complex if you don't have the tree. So you might have some of the species in the tree, but not all the species. I might not know branches in a portion of time. I might just know like, the overall nesting history, that sort of thing. And there are tweaks and methods to get around this. OK, but the basic idea is the same. You have your tree, and you figure out how much time is in that tree. So how is this used in practice? So here's a case of. Um, Various areas in, I think, Sri Lanka, 
Yeah, Sri Lanka. Freshwater crabs. I'm trying to figure out which one we should, we should conserve. Okay, so this is a fairly young group. 7.4 million years. Okay, and here are all the various species. Okay, and they map on what, what their habitat as well. Okay, and here we see putative species. So possibly you know, different species. And this is like marsh, and then end up can be found only in Sri Lanka. Right, which matters a lot if you think about conservation. And they measured three areas: highland, upland, and lowland. Okay, and measured species richness and phylogenetic diversity. So, what do you see from this plot? What else? The highland has a lot less species than the Mm-hmm. Yep. Good. Now, something should be making you uncomfortable about this plot. A scientist. There's no error bars. Right, you, should always, you should feel like it's a little itch once the air bars on a plot, right? And you can see why there's no air bars. So, like, number of species, well, species is one thing that you can sort of discreetly count, but actually, we're not completely really sure what the species boundaries are. Right, we had some putative species there. So, it could be that some of those species are actually one species, some of them are actually two species. Right? It could be we've missed some species. Right? So, there's some uncertainty in these pl plots, they're just not telling, them, telling us it. Okay? It might be hard to measure what the uncertainty is, but it's there. So, you think about that. Um, <coughs> and same thing for phylogenetic diversity. So do we know the phylogenetic tree branch length with absolute certainty? No. We don't even know the tree that well. Right? And so there's some uncertainty here, too. That might matter, because we might say, okay, yes, we can pave the upland and highland and save the lowland. Right? But it could be the error bars are such, so high that actually we can't tell lowland from upland. Okay? So it's always good to think about uncertainty. Any questions about that? Okay, so here's a summary they wrote. Here's a good chance to read it. Cool thoughts about that? Maybe you can look at these plots of um, different regions and sort of the, the levels of criticality. Right? So, worst one is um, critical and this, well, let's go down to non threatened. Right? So, this range, and you can see where the range is distributed across the species richness and across the locations. Right? So, using this phylogenetic diversity measure, they first of all can make a case. We're going to lose 72 million years of history. They're just saying we're going to lose 10 species or something like that. So it gives you additional arguments. But also, you value the regions differently. It's okay. If I only save one region, so they have similar species in these two, so there's more diversity when you save this one. Why may you want to value that as a conservationist? Why not just use raw species count? Mm -hmm. 
if you look at just a straight species richness count and you didn't look at what did the other, the other were endangered or not, say, oh, the highlands need to manage the system because they have a lower species count. But they are, they're in a better position than the lower lands. Mm -hmm. right, so looking at risk is also plays a role, sure. And the phylogenetic diversity itself, I mean, tells you something about sort of how much change there could have been, right? So if we care about maintaining sort of the most like morphological diversity or uh, chemical diversity or that sort of thing, you're expected to get that more from maximizing phylogenetic diversity than from maximizing just number of species. Right? Think of the difference between you know frog, elephant, and lion versus three frogs. Right? There's a wide variety of behaviors and ecologies and things like that you can save by doing that TD measure. So people have actually used phylogenetic diversity plus ideas of conservation to figure out these high-risk species. So here's a sample tree, just basically a cartoon. Red list of the you know, endangered species. It's a globally curated list. And they can go and get a histogram of score for different species. Okay. And they can figure out which species are most endangered. So, which is a mixture of, like, sort of most worth saving. So things that are really endangered and also have a lot of phylogenetic diversity, right? So think about a platypus versus another squirrel species, right? If they're equally, equally endangered, a platypus is just really, I mean, it's, it's a mammal that lays eggs. It's crazy, right? And we can sort of, you know, figure that out from looking at the phylogenetic diversity. Not that it lays eggs, but figuring out, you know, it has lots of weird traits. And one nice thing is this gives you a different measure. So rather than just saying, okay, we have these 40 endangered species, you can say, we have a ranking. So now not all species are equal. Now some species are carrying more evolutionary history. So allows you to you know, decide between species. All right, so now it's your turn. So I gave you $8 million to save species. Let's assume you want to save the most species. Um, which combination do you want? So you can choose A, which is these two species. You can choose B, which is these two species, and so forth. And it has to equal $8 million or less. And this, is, this is a quick, quick, uh, clicker question. Yeah. All right, uh, right, yeah, write it down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Adding may be required to get this question right. Sorry. So now we're, now we're just trying to optimize just the number of species. Many of you are getting it wrong. Okay, now talk to your neighbors, and you can re-enter re your answer. Yeah, so each branch is a, yeah, so individual, this I is a species, two is a species, three is a species, four is a species. So four species total. Yeah. And so you want to save the, you know, you want to save, you can save all four of these, great. What? We have to gamble on life. We get to save things, you get to make a difference. I'll frame it that way.
But we're not, we're, not, we're not doing time yet. We're just doing number of species. Yeah. yeah. All right. Couple, one more minute. We enter your answers. Talk, talking has helped people, but not all people. What? There isn't a right answer. There is. It depends on what parameters you want. Right, but as I said, just the, num the most species. So what we want to save is just the number of species. Yeah. Oh. Could we, could we overanalyze this question? <laughs> but prime numbers are good. <laughs> All right, last minute. Okay, good. Oh, one of you now has it right. Yeah, the answer is B. All right. Um, so that way we save two species. It's not C. Oh, sorry, C. C. Uh, it's because B has three species. C has only two. Adding is required. All right. Now, similar question. Seasonal history. That requires adding two different things together, so it'll be even harder. Do you need to take off your shoes to count? That's okay. All And yes, this has two right answers. Okay, one more minute. Get one answered. Thank you. Those are changing their minds. See the the polling in lifetime. Yep. All right. Done. Good. Everyone got that right. A or C. Um, more of you chose C than A, which is kind of weird because A is cheaper. So you want to just burn through your conservation money. Have no extra. That's your choice. So this is basically PDs. You seem to understand it, right? So the question is, do people use this? And actually, it's not used very much yet. Okay. Why? Well, one thing is, it's sometimes hard to get trees, and people are working to fix that. Um, I think people just more, are more used to thinking about, um, you know, just raw numbers of species. And also, I mean, with conservation law, like in the U.S. Endangered Species Act, if you don't ever say, okay, yeah, that species can go extinct, we save everything, which is good if you know if we can afford it. But I mean, if you need to decide, you know, which ones to value more, this can come in handy. Okay, it is used. One organization uses it to fund postdocs. Say, I want, I want to work on this species. So they say, well, that has a lower PD than this other species. We're gonna give this, a, give the postdoc to her. Tough luck. So, so what you should do is kill off all the close relatives of the species you want. That way, it has increases its PD. <laughs> yeah. All right. Now we're going to do causes of risk. Okay. So looking at why certain things are at risk of extinction. And this ties back into last lecture. We talked about things that affect extinction risk, right? The things that affect extinction risk now, since the causes of extinction might be different than past causes, the biases in extinction might be different than past biases. Okay. So here's, here's a paper that summarizes various extinction risks. I can just look through that. And all this is common sense to us now at this point, right?
So one thing I could do as estimate extinction risk is like a regression, right? So I have over here my y is you know endangered, critically endangered, you know not threatened, et cetera, for different species. And here I have various traits, you know, flies doesn't fly, doesn't fly, um, aquatic, aquatic, that sort of thing, right? So we do that for various species, What's, and then figure out, oh look, aquatic is correlated with risk or something like that. What's wrong with doing that? That's one aspect, right? So that could, yeah. Something to worry about in general. Good. What else? We touched on this a bit in the phylogenetics lecture. A tree yeah, so along which we can trace the evolution. Okay, I'm conserving. And <coughs> here we have their endangered levels. Least concerned, critically endangered, endangered. Okay? Doesn't mean we don't care for the species, it means we're not worried about going extinct very soon. Okay? And there are all these traits. Right? So the ones out here are on the east side of the river. Okay? These can also eat thistle. And these use lookouts. Right? And you might have many species like this, right? And I might then, you know, do sort of a simple regression where here's my extinction risk, you know, low versus high. And do a correlation and say, yep, okay, those with these traits have a higher extinction risk, right? The problem is that these are all correlated, right? These all share all this history. So if I say, oh, eating thistle increases your extinction risk, right? it increases your conservation priority, right? it could be that it's eating thistle through that correlation, but also could be just you know, being on the east side of the river. I mean, that's where I have all the industrial plants or something. Right? But if I count it, I say, well, look, you know, there are five things that eat thistle and are endangered. Three things that don't eat thistle and are not endangered. Five versus three, that's a big correlation. Right? But I failed to account for this shared history. And so this is a case where using phylogenetics helps you correct for this sampling. You say, oh, look, this only evolved once, so it might be that. There might be something else on this branch. It might not have enough power. So even so, you know, correlation doesn't cause causation, but here we don't even have real correlation. Right? Don't with non-dependence. Okay? So the way you know, this list was actually made was using a phylogeny. Okay? So how do they do that? So this is about science and practice. So they got the list of conservation priorities. Okay. They got traits about mammals from various books across the world. And they got a big tree of mammals. Okay. <coughs> and then they used you know, various traits on that tree to cor and correcting for that tree to figure out um, extinction risk. And figure out how well each of those performed as a predictor, right? So geographical range, three stars, very very significant, right? So things that had smaller ranges, higher extinction risk, makes sense, right? Being on islands makes sense. Small litters, like our beloved pandas, yeah, makes sense. Okay, other things weren't significant, right? So you might think that trophic level, you know, being higher up in the food pyramid increase your extinction risk. And it might a little bit, but it wasn't significant in their study. Okay? Questions about this? And one thing that matters when you do something like this, so you can do these correlations, and you see, well, am I, am I right? right? Well, how can you test that? Maybe just wait a while. Right? Um, one thing you do is try predicting things. So, Given all my, you know, my traits I measured earlier, all these traits, I can take away my information about extinction risk and say, can I predict the extinction risk properly? Right? If my model is pretty good, I should do a good job of predicting it. Okay? If not, if I'm a bad model, um, I might not. Right? And so <coughs> here we see threat level versus predicted threat level. Right? And overall, we seem to do a pretty good job. Right? It's almost a one-to-one -one line. Right? And so 
this gives you some, some more evidence that your model is working well. Not complete certainty, but it makes you feel better about it, right? But again, note there's you know some scatter, right? So here's the actual threat level zero, right? And sometimes the predicted level is two, right? And it could be our model's not working well, or it could be those haven't been looked at very closely. Actually, they are, in th are at risk. We haven't noticed that yet. Okay. The advantage of this is we can now use this for other species and say, okay, this species has a small litter size but doesn't doesn't live on islands. This might be of intermediate risk. And make predictions like that. Whereas trophic level, you know, doesn't matter that much. So we can ignore trophic level. We go off and find other at-risk species. Okay. And actually, the only ones traits that really mattered in this was range, mass, similar trophic level, and density. So we can use that to predict. Okay. Um, we can also look at how things will perform with climate change. Right. So we can do, we can reconstruct climate change on a tree. A cl a cl a climate tolerances on a tree. So this species needs to have areas that have frost, this species needs to have a wet summer, that sort of thing. And then say, okay, we know the world's changing with climate change, how will its habitat tolerance, how will where it can live change? Right? Um, for example, in the southwest there's these places called sky islands, which aren't quite as cool as they sound, but they're mountains, and up top of the mountains it's coolish and there'll be pine forest. Okay, it needs to be pine forest throughout the southwest. As it got drier and hotter, some places are cool enough, they're up top of the mountains. Okay? So they've had to retreat up there. Well, at some point, you know, the tolerable band becomes higher than mountaintops. Right? So we, we, you would lose any habitat for those sky islands. Right? And so you can say, with climate change, you know, what will happen? Will they, have to, you know, will they disappear? Will they be able to move north, on, you know, hop from mountain to mountain? And what will happen as a result? <coughs> And here we can do, um, and when you can use that, then you can predict what will happen with things like phylogenetic diversity. Okay. So here we see phylogenetic diversity in various groups of plants, uh, animal, birds, mammals, and such, um, with different um, extinction risks. Okay. Um, <coughs> and here we have different climate change models. A is one set of models, B is another set of models. And so you can see how PD will change through time. Right. And again, you see, you know, it's great thick gray bands. So it's the confidence interval, right? So you don't know that could be you know, precise. It's likely to be somewhere in here, right? We can sort of see how things are declining. Okay, questions? Okay. We can also map these in space, right? So I can say, okay, this species a high, has a high PD. But also, I can say this area. What's the PD of all the species in that area? Right. Why might you want to do that? If someone's trying to convert it into a ball. Right. This is after our first example, right? A versus B. So if you can say this area has more PD, maybe you want to save it. And so here we can see what PD is in the f right now. Okay. And like I see most places, you know, as you get closer to the to the tropics, diversity increases, but so does phylogenetic diversity. Okay. Um, you can see future PD. And then it can see the change, right? And note the time, note the scale for change. It's actually this is a very bad color plot they did, but um, what's the scale here? It goes below zero. Yeah. So we can. So this is the difference. This is current minus future, right? So we'll expect to be positive usually. It can also be negative. What does that mean? Increasing diversity. Right. And so with climate change, overall, the graph is zero or higher. Right? Overall, we will lose PD. But there are areas that will gain PD. Um, so this part of France might gain PD. Same thing here with mammals. Um, there aren't many places that will gain PD, but they can. Um, and this sort of indicative, you know, with this, we see this sort of thing with climate change in general, how, you know, some areas will be worse off in some ways, in this case measures of PD, or you can have avoid measures of drought, or that sort of thing. But some places will, will, will get better, right? If you want to go rowing in the Arctic, it's a lot easier, climate change, right? <coughs> but if you're Santa, tough luck. 
So you see the same sort of thing here, right? So this is just a clean change, you know, um, kind of various effects. Now it could just be that one, you know, really weird animal, you know, the European platypus, <coughs> is moving its range, right? So where it used to be, will lower PD, where it moves to, it gains PD. So, could be, so with PD, it's so discrete that you could have, you know, one thing sister to everything else that's a really high PD, and so the movement of that thing could really have a strong effect. There's moving all these little frog species, so there's noise. All right. Um, any questions about any of this? Okay, so this went rather quickly. Um, what, are the, what are the main? Can someone summarize it? It's better to look at phylogenetic diversity than just species which is still on as far as assessing the value of different areas of different species. Yeah, it's it's worth assessing. I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't go as, as, as far as say better. But that's worth doing and checking it out, yeah. But people can vary, but that's, that's what an opinion people can say. Someone can say, yes, you must do it. Someone can say, no, you don't do it. But yeah, it's probably worth looking at more data. Good. Yep. What else? Some species are more vulnerable to extinction just because of the traits that they have. Mm -hmm. Good. What else? You also have to look at their history to understand their risk. Why? Yeah, I mean, you're right, but... Yeah, because, uh, you know, something may have happened way down along the line. Very different risk. Mm -hmm. Right, and also species may all share risk, but it's usually some sort of shared trait other than the trait you're looking at, right? So we could say that, you know, having a pouch increases extinction risk. Well, maybe it does, but it's just being in Australia increases extinction risk, right? The Myers are mostly in Australia. So to correct for that. Good. What else? What else? Good. Well, those are the main points. We went through them quickly. Um, any questions from previous lectures, stuff that wasn't clear? How do we, how do we really know that the species goes extinct? Oh, that's a great question. Um, have you heard of the ivory-billed woodpecker? What's that? Have you heard of the ivory-billed woodpecker? So there's this bird, the biggest woodpecker in North America. I mean, not penguin. Big for woodpecker, right? White beak, you know, go and just drum on the trees to call up mates and things like that. And it was in, I think, Florida, maybe in Louisiana. It was southern swamps somewhere. And people saw it. Arkansas. Arkansas. South. Arkansas swamps. <coughs> and... People, you know, saw them and sort of stopped seeing them, but then, you know, when they actually go extinct completely, right? Um, it's like looking for a Yeti or Loch Ness Monster, right? Well, you know, it's actually zero. And so people, especially at the Cornell level of ornithology, have done lots of experiments where they'll go in the field, they'll set up cameras, they'll set up you know, boom boxes playing the sounds of them, try to call them in, things like that. And each time they'll go through and, you know, haven't found anything. There was one case a few years ago of someone who was an amateur but still a very skilled bird person who claimed he saw one flying through the trees. And they went down and like, you know, did their intense sampling and stuff and now they didn't find them. So <coughs> so a case where, you know, we think it's we pre we're pretty sure it's extinct. But again, there's uncertainty, always an error bar. Right. Um, Lewis and Clark. So Jefferson was really excited about the Lewis and Clark expedition. So they traveled from eastern North America all the way to the Pacific Ocean. Right? And Jefferson was really excited about that because he thought they would find mastodons and things like that. Because people were finding fossils of these giant land animals in North America, but we didn't find any living ones. And people were still not sure about their extinction actually happened at that point. Right? So the idea that you know, nothing was extinct, things would move around maybe. And so he thought that they'd go west and find these giant animals, right? and, which they haven't. And so in theory, they could be living somewhere, you know, but they're probably extinct. Yeah, that's, that's a really good, good question. Um, <coughs> there's another case in Australia recently where they thought some animal was, ex was extinct. Actually, they found, found a small population. They're looking to save that. <coughs> yeah. And then, of course, these w wacky things like um, metasequoia, you know, which people thought was extinct, even was probably fossil. And then now we have it, you know, at, at UT, something that's over that way, right? Um, coelacanths, right? We thought it was extinct, and then oh, it's found on the fish market. Yeah. <laughs> 
So literally, if I'm a fish, fish market. Um, so there are rare cases like that too. Yeah. Good. Other other questions? Yeah. I think that I had some sort of vagueness about nested clade analysis that we went over in the book. Okay. Anyone remember nested clade analysis? So it's an approach where you take a tree of your species or your, or your populations. And you go through a procedure called you find nested clades. So here's a clade, here's a clade, here's a clade, here's a clade, and so forth. Right? And then you use a key. And the key says if you have a clade that's, you know, contains two small clades within it, say, then you might go to step five. And it's like, okay, if step five, if you see this, go to step twenty-five, and so forth. And at the end it says, your population has been expanding, or your population went through a bottleneck, or something like that. Okay. Um, the main point of that in the lecture was showing how, well, how these approaches to figuring out phylogeography. But then people came back and did actual simulations to test this, and found out that oh, this actually doesn't work at all. Right. So it shows how science works and how you can use simulations to, you know, show that other methods don't work very well. Okay. Yeah. Good question. <coughs> yes, you need to know how to do nested clade analysis with NCA. To know how it's, its role in science. Yeah, good. Other questions? Either I'm clear, people don't care. I'll think that. Anything else? I've seen where people are trying to make phylogenies. Mm -hmm. um, Oh, it's, it's, it's really interesting. So if I said to you, um, like, yeah. If I flip the coin and go out heads, heads, tails, right? And I said, flip the coin 20 times more. Like, which one head should I pick? What would you say? You say half. But your data says two thirds, right? So why do you say half? You don't think about how coins work. Some prior information about how coins work. What Bayesian inference is is a way of combining your data plus your prior beliefs to get an estimate. Okay. Um, that's all it is. And it's a little controversial in some cases. People say, well, my prior beliefs are your prior beliefs. I believe that any coin in the simulation is probably biased. Right? So that way we don't break the class. And we have that prior belief, you get a prior belief that all the coins are there. Right? So then you argue about what our inference should be about. But the basic, and it's cool, it's, it's called Bayes' rule. Um, and it's basically probably the hypothesis given the data equals probability of the data given the hypothesis times the probability of the hypothesis over that for all hypotheses. Right? So in the coin flipping case, it'd be um, you think the, the coin is fair. So the probability of getting these data, given that it's fair, is one half times one half times one half. Right? That goes into here. You're thinking probably it's fair is pretty high, right? So it's 0.9. Right? And then you add over all the other hypotheses that are out there. Okay? And that gives you the probability that your hypothesis is true given this data. Right? So right now the probability that your hypothesis is true might be 0.8 or something. Right? So if I kept flipping the coin and it tended to become you know, equal heads and tails, this probably would increase. Right? If, it, if it kept being two thirds heads, it would decrease. Okay. So in the phylogenetic context, we have ways of estimating the probability of, a tr of data on a tree given a possible tree and a possible model. Okay? So what we can do is say, let's look at over all possible trees and figure out the possible, the, the, you know, it's called the posterior probability. You have the posterior probability for the best tree with a set of trees. Yeah. And it's nice that it gives you some number you can assume. Like the probability of the tree being right is 80%. Versus the luckiest of the tree is you know, negative 2.52. Okay. Well, a lot of the trees. Or even regular likelihood, probably still located this data in the tree.
entry, you know, to O of 1 over 25. And the tree's good enough. In fact, that you can say, oh, probably the tree being right is 0.8 or something. So we'll go ahead and do that. Yeah? Can you go over Haldane's rule? Yes. <coughs> Anyone else remember it? We were talking about Wolbachia, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, it was in the same index. So if I have a species that's XX, XY, female, male, right? And I have it crossed with another species in the same genetic system. Which, which sex is the mean more likely to be infertile? The male. The male, right. Why? It's because it has the different uh, chromosome. Right, because the heterogametic sex. If it were birds or butterflies, where the females are the heterogametic sex, it would be like one to two. Okay? Now that, that's the rule. So that's just an observation about life that we see in general. It's not like it's not like a law in physics. You know, how, like so in physics like gravity doesn't sometimes turn off, you know, the function of the clock or whatever. Okay. Helding's rule is a statistical rule. It's often the case, but not always. Okay. So the the rule is just that that observation that the heterogametic sex, those that have X and Y or Z and W, tend to be infertile more in the class of these natives. Okay. The, the the explanation for it <coughs> is based on um, interactions between the sex chromosomes and the autosomal, the non-sex chromosomes, right? And so, if you know, I have my AA, AA, and my other species, I have, you know, it's possible that the necessary gene from X is now on A, right? And when they cross, you know, uh, and the necessary gene from A is now on X. When they cross, you know, the females will always have that at least one copy of that gene. Right? The males sometimes won't. Okay? And thus it causes it causes inviability, it causes infertility, it causes a bad time. And that's all this rule. Okay, and the explanation. Really great questions. Yeah, I'm gonna do a review session at the end of the semester, but I don't have to give only the full on during some people have time to ask those questions. Thanks. Yeah, on a test, would you want us to be able to regurgitate the derivative um, expression? The math thing that we learned about metapopulation. No. Oh, okay. Yeah, that was the DP over DT. Is the definition of metapopulation you just said it has yeah, I didn't give you a formal definition. Um, it's a pop it's a population system where there's turnover like each individual population goes extinct, it's like recolonized. Okay. There's more stable things, so always you know, present. Okay. And the thing that drives it is this dynamic between you know extinction and colonization. Good question. Oh, it's, um, I think it's near straight, so like beak size. It's the, that beak size that is the most stable, that is the most stable. That's the most stable. In the context of phylogenetic rates, it's most often, often used as like we have trait, what we learn through time, we can hold to the same value. So for example, I have, you know, the optimal beak size is based on the amount of kidneys that's developed, like a certain proportion of seed size. Right, so we, we could be evolving towards that. Yeah, so if I have you know species split, there's already some split there, right? But here the optimal seed size, the optimal beak size is over here, 
hit all these guys over here, right? They can evolve towards it, okay? And then they come back together, um, then their hybrids might have these really good sizes and not just regular ones. Okay. They only have like one large small okay. Good. Other questions? Good, I'll see you on Monday. And okay, I have office hours too, so if you have questions that come up, email me or ask, ask on Blackboard or the office hours.